Welcome to Ask Dr. Geyer Live, wherever you're watching. Hope you're making today your masterpiece. This is the pre-Christmas episode. That's why we're doing this early and not the last Friday of the month, which I normally do. So it's actually going to be a long time until the next one, unfortunately, but very, very excited to be here. My name is Dr. David Geyer, triple board certified orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist, and anti-aging and regenerative medicine expert. I help athletes and active people like you feel, look, and perform your best regardless of age or injury. Very excited to be here. I'm going to stay as long as there are questions, which can be two or three minutes, or it can be half an hour. You never know. Uh, just in case you're wondering uh, that, yes, which direction am I? Nope, wrong way. That is, this is a little humble brag, that is my YouTube play button. Very excited. Thank you for all of you who have subscribed to my video channel. That is a an award YouTube gives you for having over 100,000 subscribers, and it means a lot to me that people like you subscribe because hopefully you find this uh, information helpful. As always, with questions that I answer on this show, I am not giving you medical advice. I haven't seen you, I haven't examined you, I haven't looked at x-rays, MRIs, any of that. I cannot legally give you medical advice and no doctor can by social media. So this is meant for general information and educational purposes only. The goal is, is that you take this information and then you go to your doctor, you go to your orthopedic surgeon, knowing a little bit more than you did before, or if you've already seen your doctor or orthopedic surgeon, maybe it's now understanding what that doctor or orthopedic surgeon said. I get a lot of, a lot of comments where people have already seen an orthopedic surgeon, they have no idea what that information that they were given means. And so I can be a translator for you if for anything else. So. We'll, I'll just say that for now. All right, we'll, we will start with, I saw this right before we started. This is Peter, and this is great because I love this, this topic. It, does penicillin, and he's talking about penicillin polysulfate, also help with osteochondral lesions in joints without osteoarthritis? Would you recommend it for a patient after a cartilage transplant procedure, ACI, if the procedure wasn't very successful? Yes, uh, but maybe not for the reasons that uh, you typically think about. Let me go back and explain the osteoarthritis process. Now he's having an osteochondral defect and had a, a procedure for that, which is a little different uh, in structure than osteoarthritis, but it's generally the same idea after the fact uh, it turns into osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is not a wear and tear problem. I've said that in numerous videos on my website uh, and I have said it on numerous Ask Dr. Guy lives despite the fact that orthopedic surgeons that do joint replacement surgeries use that tread on a tire analogy like it's going out of style. That is not the issue. The issue is that you have this pro-inflammatory response going on, in this case the knee, with cytokines like interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and then they recruit these degradative enzymes like matrix metalloprotease uh, 3 and 13 that just chew up articular cartilage and bone and break it down. And if that process doesn't stop, that just keeps happening. That's largely why if you have a knee replacement, then everybody you talk to that's had a knee replacement, they end up having another joint replaced six or 12 months later and another joint. It's because you haven't stopped that process going on in your body. And the reason that so many people uh, end up in that situation is that they're in a chronically pro-inflammatory state. Obesity, no exercise, high stress, poor diet. There's lots of, of thoughts, chronic immune uh, diseases, things like that, that put you in a pro-inflammatory state. One of the thoughts with penicillin is that it stops those inflammatory cytokines or counteracts them, the interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, the matrix metalloproteases. And so in theory is very good at pain relief and presumably stopping the damage with arthritis issues. Osteoarthritis in theory might be good for rheumatoid arthritis and might do the same thing for an osteochondral defect. Now what the company, so I, I've said before this is in phase three trials in the United States with the FDA. I think the study is being done at Northwestern in Chicago uh, with Paradigm who brought it to market in Australia and 
my understanding is that Paradigm says they have internal data that shows that it also regrows cartilage. I have not seen that. There's nothing published in the literature now, at least, to suggest that it does that. If it does, fantastic. I just haven't seen it. But do I think it could potentially be helpful um, after some sort of failed cartilage procedure like an autologous chondrocyte implantation, uh, something like that? Uh, absolutely. Could it be effective as for, at least for pain relief with somebody with mild, moderate osteoarthritis? Yes, it definitely could be. Again, it is used off-label right now here in the United States. When it's approved by the FDA, and, and I'm hearing that it's very, very likely that it will be late 2024, maybe early 2025, but until then it's used off-label. So I'm not telling you that you should do this. It's something you should talk to your doctor about, but I do think it is very uh, exciting. Luke, if I can get this on the screen, Luke asks, uh, is there anything that can help uh, help or fix straightening the knee? And if a knee's out of place, could that be the reason why it's not straightening? Let me do the second part of that first, and then I'll get back to the what you can do. A knee that won't go all the way straight, the only two potential thing, structures out of place that I could think would possibly be, uh, that could be going on, and your knee would be locked and not able to bend or straighten at all, it would just be stuck in a certain position, would be the kneecap Dis, actually dislocated and out of place and your knee would be bent about maybe like that. Or you could have a meniscus tear, either medial or lateral meniscus, where it's what's called a bucket handle tear. Bucket handle in the sense that it flips back and forth like the handle of a buckle, uh, bucket and it gets stuck in the center of the knee. And that uh, is almost always teenagers uh, by the nature of how they potentially can tear a meniscus. I suppose maybe early 20s. I've never seen it in anybody other than a high school student, high school athlete. Um, and those, uh, the bucket handle meniscus tear that's locked in the center of the knee, you have to take to surgery, push it back into place and repair it. Whereas the patellar dislocation, obviously you can just pop it back into place. So the vat, the the answer is yes, it's possible. That's highly unlikely. Very, very often with a knee that doesn't go all the way straight, the knee that goes all the way bent, that doesn't go all the way back is the development of scar tissue after some injury where somebody didn't work to get all the range of motion back. And if you leave a knee, especially not being able to go all the way straight for more than maybe four or six weeks, that becomes very likely. Here's the bad news. And I say this, uh, Luke, uh, not to discourage you, but, um, why one of my lights just went off. Um, the, uh, the success rate of, of getting it back once it's gotten to that point uh, is very unlikely with things like physical therapy or, or home exercises. Once it gets to about four or six weeks uh, out where you lack you know, maybe 10, 15 degrees of full extension, you can't get it all the way back. Usually home exercises and physical therapy don't do it at that point. Uh, even uh, devices like an extensionator don't typically do that. And you're talking about a, a surgery usually to go in, scope the knee, and clean out scar tissue. Usually uh, even at that point, a manipulation under anesthesia where the surgeon puts you to sleep and then forcefully bends it, that doesn't even typically work. And that comes with risk of either fracture or likely patellar tendon, or yeah, patellar tendon uh, rupture. So that you, it's usually uh, scoping the knee and arthroscopic, what's called a lysis of adhesions. Um, it's just the nature of, and that's, it's probably more true with the knee than other joints, but that's pretty common for joints once they get stiff to a certain point, but especially the knee. So anyway, hope that was helpful. Um, Aloy DeLuna, if I had stem cells and PRP treatment for a back injury, what point can I start taking NSAIDs for some relief from a shoulder injury? So that's really interesting. And, and I have this discussion with other sort of anti-aging and regenerative medicine doctors and certainly orthopedic surgeons that do regenerative. There's a debate about how much anti-inflammatories potentially might interfere with something like platelet-rich plasma, something like stem cells or exosomes. And there's no to my knowledge, good studies that really say you should or shouldn't do it. I generally, when I do anything like a PRP, do shut people down from anti-inflammatories. I feel like if you're going to go to the trouble to do it, you want to give yourself the best chance of making it work. So I usually 
again, this is just based on sort of a hunch and an understanding of basic science, not that it's been studied. I usually say about seven days before the procedure or before each injection, if it's going to be a series of injections, and then about six weeks after that injection, or again, if it's a series of injections, six weeks after the last one. There is no uh, agreement on that at all and there are plenty especially in the orthopedics world plenty of doctors that don't stop people at all from anti-inflammatory so it's a matter of debate my feeling is if you're gonna go to the trouble the cost of doing one of these procedures you want to give yourself as good a chance as you can at getting it to work all right my shoulder thing turned out to be just impingement uh, took a long time to heal started in late August so impingement is tricky um, so impingement fortunately is not a tear I won't make sure this doesn't fall apart of the rotator cuff tendons but uh, sort of an internal tendinosis or tendinopathy of the rotator cuff tendons as they push up under the undersurface of the tip of your shoulder blade the acromion um, almost never needs surgery, but it is not something that typically time, if I can get that better, uh, that time typically makes better. The, the first and foremost accepted treatment, and it really works, albeit it's hard sometimes to get patients to do it, is physical therapy. Uh, strengthening all the other supporting muscles around the shoulder, take pressure off the rotator cuff, and let that heal. Maybe a short-term minimization or cutting back of exercises that aggravate it, and you focus on ones that don't, that typically is enough. I am not personally a fan of cortisone for impingement. I feel like and there are studies that show that one, albeit yes, you may feel a little better, it's not treating the actual problem, and it makes the rotator cuff tendons more likely to rupture. So I am, for just like I am for other joints, I am not a fan of cortisone for something like shoulder impingement. But uh, good, uh, the uh, good that you know uh, or that you got better. Sorry, um, Patrick. Is oral chondroitin, glucosamine, hyaluronic acid, collagen helpful with arthritis of the knee? The stories are, or the stories, the studies of those are all over the maps, uh, depending on what it is. Glucosamine and chondroitin, uh, the studies are not much better than placebo. And if you read the Cochrane reviews where they do the big system, uh, systematic um, meta analysis and, and study, they basically review all the studies. Um, said that it's not very helpful at all. I will tell you, this is anecdotally, that about half of my patients over my career have said, yes, it really helps. The studies don't necessarily justify it. Collagen, I think, is certainly, I'm putting that back on the screen for you, collagen is certainly helpful. It really hasn't been studied much for arthritis, but articular cartilage is made up of collagen, so it certainly wouldn't be harmful, and it is good for a lot of different um, reason skin and other things so I, I i don't think there's really much down and a good source of protein much downside to that uh hyaluronic acid there is some okay evidence that it's helpful as far as injections synvisc suparts uh there's a number of them uh hyalgan a number of different preparations where you get an injection uh three uh injections once a week for three weeks once a week for five weeks there are some that it's just one enormous injection the studies are um not great, but they're better than placebo. The nice thing about it, unlike cortisone, is there's no risk of making the cartilage break down faster, especially with multiple cortisone shots. I've talked about that a lot, so I think those are potentially good. The nice thing about all four of the ones Patrick mentions is there's not really a downside. Yes, anything that's injected into a joint, there's a theoretical risk of infection, but typically that's not uh, something terribly worrisome uh, or at all terribly likely. So those are typically fine, but the studies on any of those, again, collagen hadn't really been studied, but the other three, they're not great, but they're not... Um, you know they're they're not awful either one nice thing about hyaluronic acid when you're comparing it to something like platelet-rich plasma or something like that is at least it's covered by insurance uh unlike you know pretty much anything regenerative um jim in atlanta uh my uh, i love atlanta uh, i used to have brave season tickets way back in the day success rates i'm not sure which success rate uh, success rates for what um, let's see, I did that one. Let's see. 
Yeah, he says it was worried it was some kind of tear that would never heal. Very relieved uh, about putting... There should be no risk. Of, if it was truly impingement, there should be no risk of potentially causing a tear. Um, now, if there was more to it than that, and that would really be something you would only know with an MRI, in theory, I suppose that's possible. Um, and then he or she, I don't know if for sure is a he or she, be patient uh, with your bodies, everyone give it the time it needs to recover. I do agree with that. A lot of these things that we do in orthopedics are not quick fixes. Uh, Mary, frequent uh, visitor and contributor on the show, right shoulder, had cortisone help, then MRI arthritis, vegan diet, um, uh, OMAD, which is that one meal a day um, for inflammation. Is there anything else I can do for the inflammation? So Mary, I don't know if you just got here. I do like uh, that penicin polysulfate uh, as a, at least theoretical, not medical advice, but just something that I think could potentially be uh, helpful. Uh, I think, yeah, fixing diet, I think exercise, uh, figuring out chronic stress, any other underlying uh, disease processes. I'm not a huge proponent of anti-inflammatory medications like Advil or Aleve, especially long-term, but, but um, just kind of my thoughts on that. Um, and then says it was the supraspinatus. That's typically the one uh, involved with anything like that. Um, yeah, glucosamine and chondroitin, um, is not necessarily an anti-inflammatory, and to be fair, from a, like an arthritis standpoint, we're not really sure what it would do to work. It people suggest that it helps to build up cartilage. There's no real evidence of that, but um, I will tell you, people close to me, family members uh, that swear by glucosamine and chondroitin that it really helped with their, especially early arthritis. But again, the study's not terribly good. Um, and is the grinding wearing down cartilage? It certainly can be, but there's lots of reasons for a grinding or popping sensation inside of a joint that have nothing to do with articular cartilage. It can be how one surface sort of moves over another. If it's uh, not moving in the exact same spot, it causes that. It could be scar tissue, any number of things. So I, I never tell people that that's definitively cartilage. If you put your hand on the, the kneecap of let's just say an entire, each member of a girl's soccer team, about a third will have what we call crepitus or that grinding sensation. If you were to scope their knees, they would all look completely normal as you would hope it at high school age. So that's not typically uh, a sign of, of cartilage. Now, if you're bone on bone, then obviously that could be. Um, for sure, for the shoulder impingement, did some exercises, changed my exercise regimen. Um, definitely helpful. Um, yeah, and that is one thing, uh, the physiotherapist, that I, I will say is that people a lot of times will tell me, oh, I don't need to do physical therapy, I go to the gym. That isn't the same thing. The exercises in the gym are not at all like the exercises you do in physical therapy. In the gym, even with machines, it's big muscles, the pec muscles, the deltoid, the lats, they're not working the rotator cuff and the, the paraspinal muscles and the, the shoulder stabilizing muscles. That's not what those machines are designed to do. And so what uh, Foreshore is saying, seeing a physical therapist, have them give you exercises that you do every day, make sure you do the proper technique, uh, can be very uh, helpful. Um, avoided surgery for a torn meniscus was able to ski and doing fine. I'm really, really glad to hear that I helped somebody avoid surgery. That's to be fair, my whole career now, 16 years as an orthopedic surgeon where I did thousands and thousands of surgeries. I've really pivoted my career now to try to help patients avoid surgery and there's a variety of different ways that I do that. Um, twisted your ankle, is it possible for your leg to shut down, stop walking? If you twist it so badly, it can cause knee pain. I suppose, I, I, yeah, I don't want to necessarily answer, but I mean, you could have a bad ankle fracture. Or, I mean, a bad ankle. No, I mean, you should still be able, it's not gonna, uh, uh, I mean, it may be stiff because it swells up after an ankle uh, ligament injury, but it typically, I'm not sure what shut down means. So, uh, no, the, um, yeah, the, Jim, the, the what I'd say, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. I don't know how many human studies. I know the, some of the studies that haven't been published yet, but uh, if you go to PubMed and just search exosomes, uh, you will see some of that. I don't know it off the top of my head, but uh, they, all I would say is they look promising. There's a long way to go, just like anything with regenerative medicine. Uh, there's a long way to go. And then 
slowly, slowly, I, I normal life. Not sure what that means, but very much appreciate it. All right, that looks like it's it. About 20 minutes, lots of fun. Very, very grateful that you've been with me for 2023. I look forward to seeing you all in the new year. Uh, very, very honored that I can help in any way, whether it's to avoid surgery, like uh, uh, who is that that Patrick said, uh, whatever it is, I'm, I'm happy to help. If you want to come see me as a patient, because this is literally the extent that I answer questions for people that I'm not, uh, that aren't my patients. I don't do it on YouTube, uh, in comments, I don't do it in response to emails, but I'm happy for you to see me. You'd have to come to Charleston, South Carolina to see me, even if we did a Zoom consult, just to see if what I do lines up with what you do. Uh, and in my type of practice, uh, that's not possible for everybody, but there is information in the description about how you can do that if in 2024, you'd potentially come consider coming to Charleston and, and letting me work with you. About 40% of my patients now come from all over the country uh, to see me. So I am very, very happy to help. Just reach out to me and either me, I will, or somebody in our practice will get back to you and work on setting that up. I have, hope you have an amazing rest of 2023, an amazing Christmas and rest of your holiday season. And I will see you in the new year. Have a wonderful, wonderful 